Okay, so I think we can get started now. So again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all dear ActSAF partners. So thank you very much for joining us today. So it's my great pleasure to, to welcome you to this fifth session of the ActSAF series, this technical trainings on sustainable aviation fuels that are being delivered under the ActSAF program. My name is Bruno Silva, and I am the fuels officer at ICAO, and I'm here with the ICAO officers working on fuels and ActSAF, and with the focal points on environment from our ICAO regional offices. So uh, this series of trainings has been developed following the engagements with many states participating in the XF program, which highlighted the need to level up the conceptual understanding of CEF. So once again, I'm pleased to see you again here in high numbers, uh, which reflects the sector's interest for knowledge on CEF and testifies on this value, uh, on value of the series to deliver high quality information to states and industry. So I'm happy that we're uh, back with this XF series for following a very busy summer. As many of you are aware, there's a lot going on at ICAO. Uh, we had the we had the stock taking in July, which focused a lot on SAF, LCAF, and, and clean air energies. And we had uh, a series of other events uh, on XF before that, and we had the environmental regional seminars too. So it's been a busy year at ICAO, and I'm happy that we are now back on uh, with the XF series. So, uh, so today's session uh, will we'll cover uh, self-conversion pathways. So uh, this session intends to provide participants with in-depth technical knowledge on four main self uh, uh, conversion processes. So, and to deliver this training to you, uh, as we have been doing for the all the other XF series, uh, we are going uh, and we're we're trying to get like people that have practical experience on the topics that we're covering. So we're very honored and grateful to count on the technical expertise of five key players in the world of self production. They have kindly accepted to share their knowledge and technical know-how to present four main self conversion processes that are uh, being used today uh, or are being considered by many initiatives to produce SAF uh, today. So this is our list of speakers. We have Astrid Sonneval, the Technical Development and OEM Partnership Manager at Neste, we will talk about the half a pathway. Uh, we have Chris Ryan, Chief Operations Officer at Givo, who will present the alcohol to jet pathways. Uh, we have Ryan Walt who term single point licensor at Sazol. We'll team up with Robert Hankel, licensing man manager at Topso, to present the Fisher Trop pathway. And finally, we have Alexander Jordan, co-founder and executive vice president of SAF Plus Consortium we we'll present the power to liquids technology. So big thank you to all of you. I know like we have all very busy agendas. So very thanks a lot for your time and our willingness to share your knowledge here. So now uh, let's take a look at the agenda for this training. So uh, before leaving the floor to our speakers, I'll give a short update on the ICAO XF activities and provide some insights on our preparation for the upcoming third conference on aviation and alternative fuels which will take place in Dubai from 20 to 24 November. Then we'll move to the four presentations, which will be given in the sequence that is shown here. We start with Nasty, then Jivo, Sazol, Topso, and then SAF Plus Consertion. And after the final presentation, we'll uh, save time, hopefully around 20 minutes for questions and answer sessions. So uh, I hope you will make full use of the session to ask questions and please raise your hand or post your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to address them during the Q&A. So your questions may also be targeted directly to our speakers today, and we encourage everyone to make today's training as interactive, as collaborative as possible. So let me now begin with a short update on the ACTSAF uh, program, where we stand. So as we always say, like all the, the most recent information is in our website. We are reaching, we're getting close to 100 member states participating in the program now, like I think we are in 87 states. And so uh, the numbers are increasing and uh, and the uh, interest of member states are is also in increasing. Uh, and we're, we're seeing that very clearly. So, and if you go to the next slide, so, uh, so here uh, again, like the, the a key request that we are receiving from our uh, XF partners is the conceptual training on SAF. So we had four events before this one. Today we'll talk about conversion processes and the future sessions uh, will focus on other aspects, 
And uh, again, as we always say, like any feedback is welcome. Like if there's any topic you do want to see covered here, please contact us and we'll try to find the best speakers for covering that. Next slide, please. So uh, some updates on what happened next F, uh, on the last months. So uh, we we developed and published the template for Ceph feasibility studies, which is now available on the IK website. I'm happy to say that this was the first like main outcome like uh, of the collaboration that is happening under ActSAF. We shared the draft uh, uh, templates with all the ActSAF partners. We received a lot of comments. We adjusted uh, the template and now it is available for use in the IK website. So uh, we expect it to facilitate the outreach of results uh, because many feasibility studies will be developed uh, in the ActSAF. So we already have three new feasibility studies that are being developed under the existing IKUU project for Zimbabwe, Cote d'Ivoire, and Cabo Verde. And they will be the first ones using this template. And uh, we have also financial resources provided by ACTSAF partners that will allow many additional feasibility studies. So here's a list of the 10 uh, partner states that are being uh, considered for, uh, uh, for, for additional feasibility studies with the new IKUU project. And there are other projects being stu structured as well. And we also note that there are studies being pursued uh, by uh, XF partners. And, uh, and uh, the XF partners are invited to contribute. So uh, it, the only requirement is really the expertise with development of clean energy studies. So not necessarily an XF focal point. So if any of you here uh, know any expert that could be interested in that, please contact us uh, and uh, we'll, we'll try to see like the possibility of engaging those experts in these feasibility, the development of these feasibility studies that are coming. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, in line with these, so we're also, one, one request that we're he hearing a lot here is the need for coordinate efforts uh there are many studies many activities being developed around the world and so to try to get a global view of these initiatives we launched this tracker for feasibility studies so the where we are presenting details not only on the ikeo feasibility studies but also the studies that are being developed by the xf partners so uh if there is anything missing here on this tracker again please let us know and we will include on, 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 on the website and we will coordinate with these uh, partners that are developing feasibility studies so that we can coordinate the efforts to the best uh, extent possible. And finally, uh, so this is the process towards CAF3. So as I said in the beginning, like we're having a very busy year due to the preparation to the conference. In July, we had a very busy uh, uh, pre cath 3 and stock taking and policy finance consultations. We had the environmental regional seminars uh, early in the year. We also had like uh, uh, other uh, uh, round tables and, and coordination with financial institutions as part of this project. And our next uh, milestone is the pre cath 3 outcomes consultation, which will be held like from 25 to 26 September in a couple of weeks from now. So that's where we will start discussing like the global framework for cleaner energy for international aviation. And then finally, we'll start uh, receiving the uh, working papers for the, the main conference in November. So the secretariat papers will be published early in October. And then we will expect the states and international organization paper submissions by the 17th of October. Then we'll have the conference and finally, uh, uh, we hope to have a nice message to share at the COP28, which will just uh, follow the CAF3 in UAE. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. So so here are the details of what I just mentioned, right? So we had the stock taking in July uh, and uh, the, this consultation folk we, and uh, the stock taking, we made it a bit different this time because we also had this pre-CAF consultation part which focused on policy and financing matters with the involvement of public and partner financial institutions and other relevant stakeholders. So, and now we're going to go to the pre calf outcomes consultation uh, in a couple of weeks in September, and uh, where we'll have this consultation with a focus on possible CAF3 outcomes, finally leading up to CAF3 in November. Okay, so I 
think that's it then. So these are, uh, again, like if you have any questions on uh, the, everything that is going on here in XF, feel free to contact us. And if that, I would like to hand over the floor for our first speaker uh, from HEFA, if you can move to the next slide here. So Astrid Sunderwald, we will talk about the HEFA process. So Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your participation. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Bruno. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, as I said, I'm Astrid Sonnenfeld, working with Neste in the Renewable Aviation Division. Neste is uh, the leading soft producer today, and as such, we're uh, happy to contribute to this uh, training, explore, uh, explain more about um, the HEFA technology pathway for soft production, uh, the main one we're using today. So uh, let's start with a few of them, the basics, the generics, um, HEFA stands for hydroprocessed esters and fatty acids. Uh, the long version, we call it HEFA SPK. Uh, that is mainly the designation under the ACM jet fuel specifications. Um, HEFA uh, has been approved for commercial use as of 2011, um, so for quite a while now. Um, and the ways of producing it, the properties, uh, the typical fuel properties, uh, are all summarized in Annex A2 of ACM D7566, um, the main fuel specifications for so-called synthetic blending components, the types of stuff that you're, you're allowed to blend into fossil jet fuel, uh, because that's still required today. Um, this type of HEFA can um, um, it still needs to be blended into fossil jet fuel, and you can blend that up to 50%. Um, before uh, the blended uh, product is uh, uplifted by aircraft. Um, HEFA uh, SPK is currently uh, the most economical pathway for soft production. Uh, it's being used for the majority of, of soft available today. Um, so we use it as our main uh, production route um, and we do so at our uh, commercial scale renewable refinery. So it's a proven technology um, with a readiness level of like fully mature, so nine uh, commercially deployed at scale. Um, at Neste, we started uh, doing our research and development uh, into this area many decades ago. We patented our so-called NextBTL technology about 25 years ago, um, which is also the, the key um, uh, technology we use for our HEFA production today. Um, maybe it's good noting that there's other uh, technology licensors uh, out there today also uh, making the uh, HEFA production technology uh, available to uh, independent project developers. So let's start with the feedstocks. Um, HEFA can be produced from all sorts of oil, oils and fats. Um, so to give a few examples on the left hand side uh, depicted are the waste and residue oils and fats, the ones we use as, as Neste um, for the production of our SAF. Uh, today we make our SAF from um, animal fat and used cooking oil, but there's other types of waste and residues that fit well with this conversion pathway. Examples would be um, uh, wastes from vegetable oil processing um, or, or fish processing. Um, Technical corn oil is a good example, which is a, um, a residue from um, corn ethanol production, but also tall oil, a um, residue stream from um, the uh, the industry converting pine wood to pulp is, um, is a good potential feedstock for uh, the HEFA conversion pathway. HEFA can equally well be applied for converting vegetable oil, so crop-based feedstocks into, um, into SAF, and then uh, typical examples would be palm oil, uh, rapeseed oil, uh, camelina, soybean oil. Currently, we don't use them as nested for SAF production, but um, looking simply at the technology that can be done. Um, and if we then make the connection back to um, Corstia, I think for quite a few of the feedstocks depicted here, there is default LCA, so life cycle analysis uh, values available, indicating the greenhouse gas savings um, of the final product. And that varies from one feedstock to another. So for our animal fat used cooking oil based stuff that we supply today, that's about 80%, but that figure depends on the feedstocks um, you use. We move to the next slide. 
Um, how much of that type of feedstock for the HEFA technology pathway is available? If you look just at the waste and residue type of uh, oils and fats, as the ones depicted on the left uh, hand uh, on the previous slide, we're talking about 40 million tons per year by 2030. With uh, that um, um, supply being uh, basically spread or scattered across the globe, um, there is ultimately also other types of uh, oils and fats that we believe as Nestle provide good growth potential for the half a technology pathway beyond 40 million tons per year. Um, and the, the two main ones that we're working on are so-called novel vegetable oils. Um, so those that you produce through advanced agricultural concepts like intermediate cropping or silver pasture, the ones that you can produce without uh, the risk of land use change, but also algae are a good source of uh, producing both protein and fats, and then the fats you can use to power up your HEFA production. So that's just to give a bit of a feel, what do you need to power up this, uh, this technology pathway? Then we move on to the process. So how does it then work? Well, we work with quite a wide range of um, oils and fats that can be um, deployed for this uh, technology. And typically, particularly if it's waste and residues, those uh, feedstocks tend to be com contaminated, containing impurities. And that's the, the very first step is removing those impurities from the feedstock. Um, sounds easy, but it tends to be difficult because the impurities vary quite a bit uh, from one feedstock to the other. Um, so that's where a, quite a big part of our um, uh, refinery is also built around cleaning up the, the feedstock so that it's clean enough to feed to our refinery. That's where you get the, the so-called hydro deoxygenation step, which put simply is about removing the oxygen from uh, the molecules. That's done through a catalytic process. You need a catalyst, you need hydrogen, and combined you can use uh, that setup to remove the oxygen um, from the molecule. And as such, you end up with very simple uh, straight hydrocarbons, the so-called N-paraffins. Um, those are quite stable, clean molecules with a very high energy density. And that's where you uh, go to the typical last step of uh, the half a technology pathway, and that is about cracking and isomerization. You could summarize that as tuning the, the molecule so it fits the exact proper properties of the jet fuel specification. For example, isomerization is where you improve uh, the gold property, so actually a, uh, the jet fuel is, is suitable for, uh, for flying at high altitudes. And then uh, we can uh, briefly zoom in to our, our production uh, and one particular production facility to just first show the bigger picture. Um, we come from uh, producing about 100 kilotons a year of SAF by 2019, but we are uh, growing our capacity quite rapidly. So by next year, we are capable of producing 1.5 million tons of SAF per year um, that is uh, made possible both through investments in our uh, Rotterdam refinery where we're adding soft production capability, but also in Singapore, we're both expanding and add, adding soft capability. By 2026, we um, grow that uh, production capacity to 2.2 million tons of SAF, made possible by further investments into um, our Rotterdam refinery expansion. And then we are already penciling the next wave of um, asset developments for further capacity growth. And that growth will be powered on the one uh, way that by this half a technology pathway, but also at Neste, we recognize that ultimately um, to, to decarbonize the aviation industry at scale, we need a whole wide range of feedstocks and technology pathways. So part of that growth in the future for Neste will also be in other uh, soft conversion pathways than half a. If we then zoom in on Singapore, um, it's a it's not a soft production facility per se. So what we hear a lot today is we need to build a soft plant. Um, typically, a plant produces multiple products. So this is a refinery that has been up and running since 2010, where we uh, were producing various renewable products already um, with an initial capacity of that renewable refinery of 1.3 million tons. Um, it's located, well, as mentioned, in Singapore, those that know the area, it's on, in Tuas, so on the west side. Um, and what we decided a few years ago is that we need to up our capabilities to produce 
stuff. So we've been uh, modifying and expanding that refinery um, and that um, soft production is starting up this quarter. If we then move on to the next slide um, to give you a feel of what is it that we're then talking about in terms of skill and investments. Um, this expansion of our Singapore renewable refinery uh, means we're growing the total capacity of production from the initial 1.3 to 2.6, so doubling the capacity and up to 1 million tons of that uh, capacity uh, per year um, will be set. Um, what we also did as part of this um, expansion product, um, project is adding so-called pre-treatment facilities, um, allowing us to, to take in an even wider range of um, waste and residue materials, um, and if we talk just about this expansion project, we're talking about an investment of about 1.6 billion euros. Um, so that's quite a bit of money. I think if we compare this to other technology pathways, it's good to keep in mind that if you look at the overall economics of HEFA or HEFA type stuff, it's a not the cheapest feedstock that we use. So quite a bit of the ultimate price of, of HEFA type self is made up by the price of the feedstock and uh, the amount of capex, back up, capex investment required um, to produce this type of self is comparatively low. So that's where you'll see uh, maybe the difference also in um, compared to uh, um, a few of the other uh, technology pathways that will be presented today. I'll leave it um, at that for now and I'll hand over to, to Jivo. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was good to, to know like uh, more about the HEFA. We, we hear about the HEFA process all the time, right? So this is the most common that we're hearing today. So it's good to have more technical information and also to know Nesty's plant uh, and, and, and plans for ramping up for the production. So now let's move to the next uh, uh, next pathway. So we we'll talk now about alcohol to death with Jivo. So we have here Chris Ryan, Chief Operation Officer at Jivo to present this uh, technology for us. So Chris, uh, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Bruno. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, loud and clear, thank you. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining me and allowing me to present about uh, the ATJ technology today. Um, if you go to the next slide, a little bit about me. I've been in the industry converting renewable resources to various products for 35 years. It's been a long time. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm most proud of is being a, a founder, co-founder of NatureWorks LLC. So this is a company that converts uh, sugars into plastics called PLA. And uh, there's a number of plants in operation or in development around the world. Um, so, and we did that, uh, NatureWorks is uh, part of Cargill. And I spent 17 years at Cargill. And so what we're doing at Jivo today is basically taking what we learned at Cargill in terms of uh, finding low cost, plentiful carbohydrates and turning them into products that people care about. In this case, obviously today, I'm gonna to talk about SAF. And when I talk about carbohydrates, those can come from a variety of feedstocks. So next slide. So the ATJ pathway is uh, depicted here. You start with an alcohol that you can get from a variety of places. You do dehydration, oligomerization, uh, hydrogenation, which is referred to by different terms. Hydroprocessing is another term in order to get to SAF. And this is a pathway that uh, was certified in 2016 when you start with an alcohol called isobutanol. And then shortly thereafter, it was certified for ethanol. So you can go ethanol to SAF. And, uh, and there's other alcohols you can imagine using, but though, these are the two that currently are certified. Uh, the technologies to convert alcohol into SAF are in commercial use today. They're just not uh, assembled in the sequence here all running in concert uh, today. That's the that'll be the new the new part when uh, when we commercialize this technology. Um, so that this technology is uh, alcohol the jet. It's 
it, it's a, the technology that is, is necessary, obviously, to convert alcohol to jet. But there's things that are far more impactful in terms of making a product, making a SAF that the aviation industry really cares about. And that's the choice of the feedstock. That's the choice of the process energy that you use to run this process. You want zero carbon process energy, ideally to get the lowest carbon uh, SAF that you can make. And, it, and, it, and the whole business system around this. And I'll talk about this in the next few slides, but just keep that in mind that the technology is great. It's the heart of the system, but it's really the whole business system that really can make or break this as an opportunity. Go to the next slide. So we've, um, we've operated a, a demo plant to convert alcohol to jet since 2011. So it's been a number of years. And we use the SAF that we made off that demo plant in order to gain certification. And we also use that SAF to demonstrate commercial use uh, across the world. And this is a, a map that depicts all the different places where we've used SAF in order to prove that, yes, you really can drop this into existing uh, supply chains and uh, it's ready for use. Next slide. So just a couple slides on the technology itself. Um, so you, we start with alcohol. It could be ethanol, it could be isobutanol. We've used both. And the first step is to convert the alcohol into an olefin. And so this is shown in this slide here. After the first dehydration step, you make an olefin. And <clears throat> these olefins are used in the chemical industry and in the fuels industry every day. Uh, they're just not renewable necessarily. Um, so the, the industry already knows how to convert olefins into a variety of products. In this case, to make SAF, you take the olefin, you go through what's called oligomerization. So there you're just connecting olefins together. Um, and so you connect a number of these together. You make uh, this unsaturated SAF product. And, and then the last step is you hydrogenate that in order to make a fully saturated SAF. One thing to keep in mind, when we do the hydrogenation, we're, we're talking less than 1% or right around 1% by weight of hydrogen relative to SAF. So it's, it's not much hydrogen. Um, so that, that's, those are the steps. To go to the next slide. So the first step, dehydration, uh, this one is uh, just to highlight some of the key points. It's in commercial operation today. Um, there are people that make uh, ethylene from ethanol in order to serve the polyethylene uh, market. Uh, there's also uh, ethylene glycol being made from ethanol. So there's, there's a number of commercial operations there's a variety of technology providers, which is good. Uh, example technology providers are shown here. Axons, Lummis, Technip, KBR, UOP. Um, and so you, you have a selection. And the good thing is, is it's a very high carbon yield process. I say carbon yield because in this step, you're eliminating water uh, in order to convert the alcohol into an olefin. So that mass you're going to lose, but the carbon itself is retained through this step. You know, you, you typically see 98 to 99% carbon yield. So it's very carbon efficient from that perspective. It is the most energy intensive of the steps in making SAF. And so if there were one step you were going to focus on uh, in order to find ways to reduce capital, reduce operating costs, reduce energy use in the chain, this would be the step you'd look at. Next step. So the uh, oligomerization, hydrogenation are, are the next two steps in the chain. Um, these are, uh, again, in commercial use. Uh, example technology providers are up here. Um, there's, uh, again, very high carbon yields. It's a very efficient process. Um, 
And these are these steps are already done to make fuels today. So uh, so th those are the steps in making ATJ. So if you go to the next slide. So that what I want to spend the next slides on are around the, the business system that you're going to build in order to, to make SAF and how important that is to make a product that the aviation industry really cares about. So the first thing is, is the feedstock for the ATJ. So first you got to start with alcohol and there's a variety of ways you can get that alcohol. Um, and the way you get the alcohol can make a big difference in the scalability of this system. You know, how many of these things can you build? How big can they be? How capital efficient is it? It also affects the carbon footprint of the uh, of the product and the sustainability of the product as well. So uh, we at Givo are focused on using carbohydrates as the feedstock, but that's certainly not the only feedstock you can use. And the reason we use carbohydrates is kind of depicted on the right side of this slide. Um, the carbohydrates are the, are the most abundant natural material that's in the world. Um, it's made by photosynthesis of plants, taking CO2 from the air. They fix it, convert it to carbohydrates. And by doing that, they basically are doing a lot of the work that we need done in order to make SAF. So in, in a later slide, I'll show you that the amount of energy it takes to convert the carbohydrate to SAF is relatively small compared to the amount of energy that the SAF contains. And the reason that is, is because we're taking advantage of, of nature and photosynthesis and letting that do a lot of the work for us. Now, carbohydrates can come from a variety of plants. Um, it can come from certainly a residue from, uh, from food crops, but it can also come from wood, uh, energy, grasses, um, just, you know, sugar cane, just a variety of different things. At Jivo, we've tested, you know, there's a, there's a variety of companies around the world that either have or are still developing different processes to convert, say, wood, you know, to convert that into fermentable sugars that we would be able to take to make SAF. Um, and so we've tested everybody's cellulose sugars or any sugars that they have, molasses, um, in order to prove that we can use these in our chain. Uh, so there's there's a lot of choices out there. Um, and again, it's going to impact the scale and the economics and the CI score. Go to the next slide. So this slide just depicts uh, at a high level the the concept that you're taking CO2 out of the air, letting the plants uh, fix that CO2 and convert it to carbohydrate. And then we take the carbohydrate from the plant and depending upon what plant you're talking about, it's gonna require either more or less pre-processing, more or less capital, more or less energy. Um, but you're gonna go, no matter what plant source it is, Ultimately, you're going to a carbohydrate that gets processed through a fermentation um, in making an alcohol. And the nice thing about that process, one of the, well, there's a few nice things about it. One of them is that fermentation process has CO2 as a byproduct. And that CO2 is really pretty high purity, relatively, so that you can take that CO2 and if you have an opportunity to sequester it, you could do that. If you want to convert it into like an e-fuel, um, if you want to use it for beverage CO2, there's a variety of uses for CO2. And that fermentation process naturally gives you a good uh, CO2 stream. So when we talk about like sequestering CO2 from the air, this is a great business system for doing that. Once we have the alcohol, of course, we go through the ATJ process to make SAF. And then you're going to have co-products and depending upon which plant you chose to use, you're going to change the type of co-products that you have. 
in in our case in Givo, our first commercial plant, large scale commercial plant, is going to be running on corn sugars, and so the byproducts are animal feed. And um, if you look at the the energy it takes that you put into the system, uh, it's depicted on the bottom of the slide. You can input, this is an example, about 45,000 BTUs of energy in order to get a gallon of SAF out, which is about 120,000 BTUs per gallon. And then you also have co-products. And <clears throat> this, this business system can be designed so you have zero carbon footprint or even negative depend upon where you source the plant and the inner process energy that you select. And so by doing that, what you're doing is not only making low carbon SAF, you're making low carbon animal feed in the, our case where we would start with a corn carbohydrate. And so you really have the opportunity to impact more than just the SAF product as well. Next slide. So one of the one of our focus areas is driving the carbon score down for the SAF as low as we can. And the reason we want to do that is we believe for our system, for the ATJ system, it's more efficient to deliver a lower and lower CI score SAF rather than more and more gallons of SAF. Because at the end of the day, uh, the, the aviation industry needs to lower their carbon footprint. If you can do it with fewer gallons, great. That certainly is more efficient from a scale perspective in manufacturing the SAF. Um, we believe that in doing this, so in order to drive the carbon score down, you really need to account for the carbon footprint of the plant you're using. And so we use the... Argonne National Lab GRE 3.0 model in order to account for that plant carbon score. And uh, when you tally up that carbon score, you can be negative carbon SAF if you select a negative carbon plant. So you have to have the right growing practices. Um, and those are things that I'll talk about in a minute. Anytime you're using a plant, you are using land. And so, you know, unless you're talking about trees from a forest, you know, if you're talking about a field, you know, we've worked in, uh, we designed a SAF plant working with beta renewables, if anybody remembers beta renewables, that was going to use uh, miscanthus as a feedstock, which is great. But anytime you're using land, you're kind of in competition with food. And in our view, food needs to be number one. You need to use land to grow food if you can. And then there's a question of what you do with the byproduct from making food or the excess carbohydrate. And so in our perspective, we want to partner with the food industry in order to make the products we make. And that, that comes from spending part of my career, a big part of my career with Cargill, where that, that's what they do. They supply the world food and then the question is, what do you do with the residue? So, um, so that's it on making lower and lower CI SAF. If you go to the next slide. This is uh, an example taken from um, what is going to be our first commercial plant for making SAF, where we're showing how we're driving down that carbon score. So if you look at the the left side of this graph, it depicts uh, fossil, the CI score for fossil jet fuel being right around 90. If you were to take a typical ethanol CI score, say 71 CI score, uh, and convert that to SAF using just grid electricity and, um, and natural gas, well, you'd have a CI score of that SAF about 95. Okay, that, that doesn't help the aviation industry, right? So it's all around how we decarbonize. So for our plant, for our first commercial plant, and, and in all our, our site selection that we've been doing, we have, we have a number of slides, sites that we pre-qualified. We select a site that has zero carbon electricity 
or um, near zero carbon electricity. So we first thing we do is defossilize the electricity. And then the way we design the SAF plant, we highly integrate the ethanol plant and the uh, ATJ side of things so that we can minimize the energy being used at that plant. And we try to site the plant in a place where we can have biogas available to offset some of the natural gas. So that really reduces, by using zero carbon process energy, really reduces the carbon score of uh, the, that SAF. Hydrogen, as I mentioned, we don't need much hydrogen, but the hydrogen we do use, we're intending to have green hydrogen from water electrolysis that would be driven by wind. And then um, we also would like to have sites like we have in our first commercial site, uh, the availability of CCS so that we can sequester the CO2 that comes off the fermentation. And then the last point on the slide, which is one I'm most excited about, and that's working with the growers to quantify on a field by field basis, their carbon score and work with them to, to make sure that they're using the practices that are driving the carbon score down, as well as uh, improving their sustainability. Next slide. So this is uh, a graphic of our first commercial plant that we've we're planning to build in Lake Preston, South Dakota. Um, we selected that site for the reasons I just mentioned. It's got availability of wind. Uh, we have a partner that's gonna build a wind farm directly connected to this plant. We've got, um, GIVO has a, an RNG biogas operation in Northwest Iowa. We'll have the option to bring uh, RNG up from that site in order to uh, trim the CI score here. And um, we're already working with farmers that represent over 50,000 acres of corn. And we're quantifying field by field their inputs and outputs so that we can uh, quantify their carbon score as well as uh, help them optimize sustainability. So this plant will produce um, not only SAF, but it'll, by weight, it'll make more uh, high protein feed than it will SAF. And that high protein feed will be low carbon. So um, we view making low carbon SAF as being really beneficial to just more than the aviation industry, also the food industry. Next slide. So uh, on the economics, uh, I show you this slide, there's uh, no numbers on here, but I'll tell you that if you were looking at the uh, cash operating cost of making SAF using the process I just showed you, that cash operating cost wouldn't be too much higher than petroleum jet fuel price. Um, the big thing though is because you're we're building a plant like this and that plant is gonna cost over a billion dollars. Um, you, we need, obviously the, the project investor needs a return on their investment. And that's where the, um, the higher, economic cost is uh, depicted in this, uh, the middle of the slide showing total required revenue for ATJ. And in order to cover that higher price needed in order to recover the, the capital investment, um, we're relying on uh, carbon value, tax credits, whatever it is that it's gonna take in order to get that price. And, uh, and that's the challenge right now, as everybody knows, it's how do you, get enough certainty in the carbon value uh, in order to make this attractive for project investors. So next slide. Uh, last couple of slides is just on this whole climate smart ag uh, practice. So like I say, we're working with the growers to quantify their uh, inputs and outputs field by field, um, measuring soil organic carbon. We're working with a variety of universities and other companies it's really an exciting opportunity. And this is all done being led by a joint venture we have called Verity Carbon Solutions, but uh, it's using uh, a blockchain technology to pull in data from the cloud, data that comes from you know the tractors that goes right up to the cloud and uh, gets pulled in along with our process data uh, so that when we deliver a gallon of SAF, we can prove what the carbon score is. And we can even talk about which fields that we source the, 
the plants from. Next slide. We've, uh, Verity has developed an app that runs on a smartphone. And they just rolled that out this year so that the grower can pull up on their app field by field what their carbon score was. They can see what their inputs were. And this is what's shown on the left part of this slide here. Um, you know, which field, uh, what their inputs were, et cetera, et cetera, in order to see what their carbon score is that's shown on the lower left. And what we plan to do is pass the value for that lower carbon plant from the market back to the grower so that they can get uh, rewarded for what they're doing to reduce their carbon score. Now, when we talk about using you know, food crops, keep in mind with the advent of um, precision ag, with all the climate smart ag, the amount of innovation going on in, in the ag industry is tremendous. And that's all translating to higher and higher yields off the existing amount of land while having less and less impact on that land, fewer and fewer inputs. And so when you look at the uh, just the conservative expected growth of yields in these fields, you know, that translates in the U.S. to a, to 300 million gallons of SAF per year without, you know, just by taking advantage of the higher yields. So that's, that's my pitch on uh, ATJ. Thank you very much. You know, it was really great to see like all these interdependencies, like, and it's not only about SAF, right? Like it's all, all about the there are many other products like, so this is very interesting to highlight. And I specifically like the link you made like with a potential link with a e fuels facility, right? Like to get the CO2 out of the, out of the ATJ facility and, and use it for more, more SAF. And I, uh, I'm glad that you have like our colleagues from SAF Plus Consortium to talk about it too. Like that sounds like an interesting possibility to, <laughs> to be pursued in the future. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation and great information shared. Okay, so with that, like we'll move to our next uh, speaker and uh, next technology. So now we start talking about Fisher Tropsch and we'll have uh, Sazo and, and Topso to talk about it. So we'll have uh, Ryan Wuhuter, the single point licensor at Sasso and Robert Hanko, licensing manager at Topso. So uh, I don't know who you start like, but- uh, I'm gonna start, it's Robert from Topso. Hi Robert, okay Robert, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Robert Henkel, and I work as licensing manager, as, as uh, already mentioned, in Topso Sustainable Fuel Licensing Team. And uh, we are very happy uh, to be part of the session today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to give you just a brief introduction into Topso. And uh, we have a long history of addressing some of the world's toughest challenges since our founding by Dr. Topso in 1940. Um, Topso brought the ammonia technology to the market for fertilizer, or a ammonia te uh, technology to the market for fertilizer production. And nowadays, more than 50% of uh, all of ammonia fertilizers are produced using our technology. Furthermore, we supported the removal of acid rain by removing sulfur oxides with our catalysts and introduced technologies to remove uh, hazard hazardous particles, greenhouse gases, and smog from the industrial emissions in the 90s. And uh, nowadays, and our agenda is uh, to support the clean energy transition. Next slide, please. And in this context, uh, Topso is one of the leading technology and catalyst providers for the production of renewable diesel and SAF using different feedstocks. And apart from that, we also have a strong industrial expertise in other fields and therefore teamed up with the leading Fisher Tropsch company, Sasso, and established the only G2L so and so-called single point licensing agreement to offer a complete e-fuels feed to product license to our customers. And uh, here uh, Topso provides the synthesis gas generation technology and catalysts, which is also implied, uh, employed in other technologies. Sasso uh, covers the FT block and Topso again, the product upgrade. The feedstock for the synthesis gas generation can be obtained from different sources natural gas, methane-rich gas, and biogas. Renewable uh, electricity and water, as well as 
atmosphere or point source CO2 or other feedstock sources. And the generation of uh, syngas can, can be done by, by using uh, Topsol's leading syncore technology uh, or via our novel development, the electrified reverse water gas shift or so-called e-reverse water gas shift technology. And um, I would like to also uh, mention a few words about the product upgrade uh, here, the Fisher Trops Wax, uh, which Ryan will talk about uh, a lot just now, uh, is being hydrocracked and isomerized in order to, to meet the specs. And um, here we make use of Topsoil's vast experience in this field um, in order to achieve uh, excellent SAF and diesel yields. And I would like to highlight also that apart from the syn synthesis gas generation, the product upgrade is of highest importance. Only with the proper technology and catalysts, uh, one can, in combination with other with the other technology blocks, generate high SAF yields and meet the specs. Uh, next slide, please. And a reason why Topso is one of the leading catalysts and technology companies is because we invest since our founding. Uh, a lot of our resources in research. And nowadays, Topso spends 9% of the revenue on R&D uh, and uh, therefore continuously improves their technologies and catalysts. Um, like in this case uh, of the synthesis gas generation, we recently developed this E-reverse uh, water gas shift, which will be a game changer in this area. Next slide, please. Without going much into details, um, the difference of this new technology as compared to the previous ones is a much lower energy loss and elimination of the flue gas. Furthermore, uh, higher syngas qualities, conversion rates, carbon efficiencies, and low consumption of H2 uh, can be achieved. And this is now the end of the top so part, and I would like to hand over to my colleague Ryan from Sassel. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Robert. Uh, good day to to everybody who's uh, who's listening and who has uh, dialed in for for this session, um, my name is Ryan Walliter. I'm a licensor with uh, with Sassel. I've been with the company for twenty years, and it's uh, my pleasure to take you through some slides related to to FT today. I think just a opening slide, um, if you don't mind moving on, Bruno. Next slide, please. There we go. Thank you. Um, um, I won't uh, delve too much on, on the corporate side. We, we want to get into the, the technical aspect, but just uh, Sassel has around uh, 2,000 patents predominantly related to, to FT and FT-related processes. So, so we do feel in a, in a good position to be able to, to give you some, some overview this, this day. Okay, let me start at the beginning. Um, Fisher Trops chemistry. Uh, so the FT process converts what we call synthesis gas, which is a stream of gas made up of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, into paraffins um, through the, let's say, the building block of a, a CH2 molecule. Um, and then as a polymerizing or building the CH2 molecules uh, together. This process can be catalyzed via two main catalysts, an ion-based process or a cobalt-based process, um, and then there's there's another differentiator again, in that uh, the FT process can be at what is termed a low temperature or high temperature. Before I get too much uh, into that, let me let me step back again. This uh, conversion of carbon monoxide and hydrogen to a uh, so paraffin building block and water is highly exothermic in the region of 165 kilojoules per mole of carbon monoxide converted. And I'll expand a little bit later on, on why that's relevant for, for the various FT technology providers. For processes where we're targeting uh, middle distillate range material, be that diesel or kerosene, we typically utilize a, a cobalt-based catalyst. And the iron-based catalyst brings some additional complexities because we refer to it as a shift active so the iron catalyst will also catalyze a, a water gas shift reaction that, uh, that brings in some process complexity. Just between the, the FT reaction and the water gas shift reaction, you know, FT tends to make uh, more mass of water than, than of hydrocarbon, just for interest. 
The full product spec uh, depends on the operating conditions of, of the FT process in question, you know, the, the specific catalyst, the operating temperatures, pressures, and to some extent, the feed gas composition. I mentioned the uh, low temperature fissure troughs. So that's typically in the region of uh, 200 to 250 degrees Celsius. And um, as I'll expand a little bit later, we refer to it as having a relatively high alpha, with alpha being the probability of chain growth for the growth of these paraffinic molecules um, in the FT reaction. Then within SASL, we operate uh, a high temperature fissure troughs as well, of an iron-based catalyst, but that's predominantly focused on making uh, gasoline and, and chemical molecules. I think it's it's worth noting as well that uh, just the bullet at the bottom, FT has the potential to make a, a very large range of materials and uh, or range of products. And the, the higher the temperature, the more complex this uh, soup of molecules that, that the FT reaction creates is. Thank you. The next slide, please. So Bruno, next slide, please. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Understanding uh, FT. So I mentioned uh, it's say that FT is essentially a polymerization reaction. And as such, it can be categorized by what's uh, referred to as the anderson schultz flurry distribution. Now, part of this uh, characterization, you know, a key aspect is what's referred to as understanding the, the alpha of the catalyst or the probability of, of chain growth. So just the two pictures on the uh, on the right hand side within this uh, with in this slide, you know, as you, you convert a carbon monoxide and hydrogen molecule to methane or to the intermediate, you have the probability of the reaction terminating in a methane molecule or progressing further to uh, to make the chain longer. This chain growth probability um, creates a, a distribution or a product distribution dependent on where you sit in this chain growth probability. For the production of uh, kerosene and SAF, we want to sit relatively close to one, so on the far right-hand side of the, of the curve, and we want to make a substantial amount of uh, C20 plus range material. And in doing so, we then end up making very small amounts of the light fraction, methane, uh, propane, butane, ethane, let's say those uh, molecules. So we prefer to make the process more carbon efficient and drive the, the growth of long chain molecules. So the, in, the, in, in practice, higher alpha is generally better. So if we can move to the next slide, please. The next slide um, depicts so what we term as the straight run destination for, for different uh, fractions of the, of the FT process. So for a a relatively high alpha-based process, we will generate a very small amount of LPG, uh, a reasonable quantity of naphtha, and then material that would straight run through the facility into the kerosene diesel range. And then we left in this orange block on the right-hand side with a heavy tail, and typically what we refer to as uh, waxes or waxy type molecules. These are long paraffinic chains, you know, from a uh, paraffinic chain of 20 plus molecules, you know, potentially upwards uh, of 100. So in order to get the fuel properties that we require, we then require hydroprocessing of these paraffinic waxy chains. And this hydroprocessing involves a degree of cracking and a degree of uh, isomerization to move these molecules back into the diesel kerosene range with minimal slip. Um, or byproduct into the naphtha and LPG range. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, it's uh, the FT reaction being highly exothermic. There are a number of technology players in the in the FT space um, with uh, different degrees of of commercial references, but each of these technology providers is effectively trying to control one single aspect. How do you keep the temperature of your FT catalytic system in control, given that the reaction is highly exothermic? So between these players, there are four main types of, uh, of reactors that are employed with the different FT processes. 
These are slurry bed reactors as utilized by Sassel and, and Axims from France. Then one has the, the shell approach, which is to utilize a high tube count, small tube diameter, but very large overall diameter reactors. Then there are the, the short path radial flow reactors as utilized by Jonathan Matthews' uh, AMS reactor system. And then we have several players who are playing in the, I use the word sm slightly smaller reactor space, utilizing micro channel reactors and the philosophy of putting down say, multiple individual reactors to, to drive overall facility scale. And those players are Compact GTL, Velocis, and Ineritech. I may have missed a, a few others, but I think these are the, let's say, the, the big names in, in the industry. Then given that the FD reaction is highly exothermic, what do you do with the heat? Most of these uh, processes you know, cool utilizing uh, steam or water vaporization to generate steam. And then in your broader process flow scheme, you need to, need to utilize the steam effectively um, in, in order to drive uh, efficiencies within your process. Thanks, Bruno. Can we go to the next slide, please? Then we've just got some, let's say, pictures, you know, a picture picture speaks a thousand words. We've got uh, a shell, but a fixed tube bed reactor um, in the middle. You now you can see multiple tubes. I think there is some complexities with the loading catalyst into these thousands of different tubes that you that you have in your reactor. But in principle, uh, a tried and proven uh, system and certainly shall operate a 140,000 barrel a day facility in uh, in Qatar, utilizing these uh, these types of, of reactors. So certainly commercially proven. Then on the left hand side, we've got uh, a Johnson Mathy cans configuration, effectively fresh gas coming in in the center of the reactor and then a relatively short flow path through a catalyst bed towards the shell of the reactor where that gas and product is, is then cooled. So again, a way to, to manage or, or limit the maximum, um, let's say, temperature that you can uh, expose your catalyst to. And then on the, on the far right-hand side, we have one of Sassel's uh, slurry bed reactors. And that one in particular is being uh, uh, hoisted into position in our Sasselberg site in South Africa. And again, we have a uh, you know, very large, large, uh, large reactor with coils in the inside to, to assist with the heat rem uh, removal and the, the temperature control of the reactor. Thank you. Next slide, please. Then I was able to uh, extract an, an image from the Velocis, uh, let's say, corporate website. Um, you know, just to to indicate to to the audience, these micro channel reactors are are typically far smaller. They have uh, you know micro channels through which the the gas uh, flows and contacts the catalyst, and then uh, water on the other side. So almost a, a plate and frame concept, but scaled down uh, substantially, and certainly can achieve isothermal operations and uh, and high high process efficiencies but tend to be limited in the scale to which they, they can be applied. And then uh, key players in, in, this, uh, in this space, Velocis, uh, Compact GTL, and Aneritech. Thank you, next slide. So I think we've, we've touched on, let's say, basic uh, FT chemistry um, and uh, the different reactor types. Uh, I think the next uh, topic that we, we need to touch on is, is FT is more than just uh, the reactor concept. There are a number of other aspects that uh, need to be managed before you have a, a, a workable process. So we've talked on uh, the, the catalyst, the type of catalyst, what conditions the catalyst operates at, how you control the temperatures of, of the catalyst in, in service. Then the, the next topics are, FT catalyst is extremely sensitive to a large number of poisons. Now in the public domain, it's uh, with sulfur, halides, a, a number of metallic species, uh, nitrogen species. So one needs to guard bed and uh, it's, uh, ensure that the polishing upstream of the syngas or the polishing of the syngas upstream of FT is, is appropriately done so that you get maximum lifetime out of your, your FT catalyst. Um, the, the next aspect is you know, 
catalyst manufacturer. These are relatively complex uh, catalysts, and there are not many manufacturers capable of uh, of producing the catalyst at, at the significant scales that we will require for uh, for the SAF challenge. So, you know, when when evaluating a technology provider, it's it's certainly worthwhile to to understand the catalyst manufacturing capabilities. We've talked a little bit to the waxy product and the, the need to hydro process to improve its cold flow properties uh, and uh, ensure the final product meets meets the, the SAF specification. But in, in practice, this waxy material uh, can congeal at room temperatures. So, you know, the actual handling of it before the hydro processing is, is something that needs to be well understood and, uh, and implemented. In order to make sure that you get the availability from uh, from your process that that you need, I think the the last topic, FT uh, the FT reaction generates water. This water stream that's generated from FT needs to be worked up and processed before it can be discharged. It does contain uh, say organics and uh, is not directly suitable to conventional uh, effluent bio treatment technologies. So there typically needs to be, say, some pre-work or pre-treatment um, before it can go to an effluent bio-treatment. Uh, and then if not using a, a typical um, aerobic uh, bio-treatment facility, there are some other options. You know, there's uh, um, so, uh, anaerobic technologies or in uh, certain circumstances, incineration may be required. Sorry, the um, next slide, please. Okay, the FT technology, in our view, is very well commercialized. We have a number of commercially operating facilities at a variety of, uh, of different scales around the world. So FT of itself and the associated product workup is, is well demonstrated and, and well in hand. I think the, the complexity in the current projects that are being pursued is how to best integrate and incorporate the front end be it a gasification-based technology or a syngas generation via, for example, a reverse water gas shift where the feeds are CO2 and hydrogen. So the, the integration to the overall flow scheme is, is a critical aspect uh, that needs to be needs to be considered for, for projects to progress. Okay, next slide, please. So moving on, um, Sassel believes the FT route can enable the sustainable fuel space. And FT is at the heart of the Sassel businesses. We've been involved in this process of um, uh, ensuring that uh, synthetic fuels can be uh, can be utilized in in a large number of applications, including aviation. So the uh, synthetic paraffinic kerosene is is Annex One to the ASTM D seven five six six specification. So this pathway is well proven. It's the first that was proven. Uh, additionally, there are some key benefits of the FT synthetic paraffinic ker kerosene. It's lower NOx emissions, lower SOx emissions, and it forms less soot on combustion, which uh, leads to a lower propensity for aircraft to, to form contrails. So there's, you know, there's the process, but also there's uh, the product premium and the uh, it's a benefits the product has uh, in use uh, in the airline industry. Uh, Sassel's done work together with uh, ECLIF, um, as well as NASA in terms of measurements from the from uh, engines. And uh, we look forward to being uh, involved with further studies in the future. And, you know, just to, to flag to, to this audience who may or may not be aware, but Sassel was involved with the first fully synthetic jet fuel flight, and that was in 2010. Next slide, please. So just uh, before we move on to a, a little bit of a project update uh, that Sassel is working on, um, we wanted to share, you know, together with Topso, we have what we term a single point license uh, construct, uh, an ability to take uh, multiple potential feedstocks, uh, pass it through a integrated solution um, from Sassel and Topso side, and to, to produce, uh, let's say, diesel or, or kerosene products. I think what we've uh, got on the slide at the moment there is just uh, our ability for a PTL configuration 
and the yields that what the yields that we can currently achieve with our existing uh, commercial production. And then uh, Bruno, if you can go just one click onwards, there's a new pop up on the slide. Uh, and one more, please. Um, we have uh, uh, we are jointly. Um, as the companies each developing our own uh, next generation of of, uh, of process. Robert mentioned earlier the electrified reactor platform that Topso are working on for the reverse water gas shift section. Sassel is also working on a next generation of Catalyst, which is currently TRL 7.8. Uh, and when we combine these two, let's say, next generation steps, we're able to step the kerosene yield from around 70% to 82%. You know, this is a uh, class leading, and uh, you know we believe that will drive the FT based processes into the future. Thanks very much, Bruno. Okay, a very short update. I've got uh, four slides that I'll I'll jump through relatively quickly. But uh, Sassel and uh, Uniper are currently developing a project in in northern Sweden, the Skyfuel Hydrogen Project. Uh, the intention being. To, uh, to take on uh, biomass feedstock and supplement uh, that biomass that's gasified with uh, hydrogen generated by electrolysis from renewable power and then uh, make uh, a synthetic aviation fuel. So this is a, a significant challenge. We're, we're well underway with this, uh, with this project. I'm expecting startup uh, around 2028. Thank you. Can you just go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. When we talk projects and projects likelihoods of success, you know it, it's key that you develop partnerships with uh, with partners who can provide as a complementary um, uh, expertise and resources into into the project. So for this uh, for this particular effort, you know Sassel was focusing on the the FT equipment and the SAF product uh, quality. And assisting with project development, given our expertise in uh, in the gas to liquid space, and uh, our partner on the other side was was Uniper, who's obviously um, majorly involved with uh, with power power sourcing, power purchasing, biomass sourcing in the European region. So between these two uh, these two organisations, there was definitely a a good symbiotic relationship with each partner bringing bring key skills into the effort. And we found a very supportive uh, uh, local municipality in the region in Sweden where we are where we are pursuing this project. So you know, a real marriage of, uh, of partners all, all driving towards a, a common objective. Next slide, please. So I think just at a, at a very high level, you know, what's happening? Uh, what are we doing? We've got, uh, it's uh, access to significant quantities of biomass. That biomass will be processed via gasification, um, utilizing oxygen from electrolysis. That gasification process will generate syngas, which needs to be cleaned up. Um, and then once that syngas is clean, we will supplement that syngas with additional hydrogen before adding it into the, the FT process. And that will mean we are able to produce uh, an advanced biofuel um, with a, a CO2 of around a CO2 footprint of around 14 grams uh, CO2 per megajoule, and then we'll be able to produce a, a renewable fuel of non-biogenic origin with a far far lower um, carbon intensity, you know, close to to zero um, CO2 per per megajoule of final product. So it's a it's a novel way of approaching this um, this uh, need to produce SAF, you know, combining a typical biomass to liquids process with a, a power to liquids process. And we see some key benefits and enablers to, to utilizing this approach. Uh, next slide, please, Bruno. I see we've uh, covered most of, of the slide, I think. So in integrating the, the two processes and exchanging oxygen um, from electrolysis across, we we're certainly able to, to improve uh, overall energy efficiency. And ultimately, with uh, with the Sassel generation of Catalyst targeted for this product, having a very high SAF yield from the from the biomass. Thanks, Bruno. I think let's uh, stop it there. And just the the last slide again, a, you know, a different overview of the Scarfuel H two project. You know where you've got the the biomass collection, sourcing, processing to get it um, fit for purpose, gasification, and then 
on one leg and then the power to liquids, renewable energy, electrolysis, hydrogen generation, feeding on the other, other input side before feeding into uh, an FT block and then the subsequent refining a um, technology block to enable, let's say, the realization of on-spec uh, uh, sustainable kerosene as well as uh, a byproduct of, of naphtha, which we're seeing increasing demand for in the in the chemical industry. So I think that's uh, let's say my uh, my thoughts for for this session. Um, I hope you found it useful, and thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan Robert. Like again, very nice to see all these practicalities. Like uh, we hear about Fisher Drops like uh, all, all the time here, and we had the XF series uh, that talked about conversion technologies, where we talked about the STM approval process, but always on the level like of testing and just getting the 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 annex approved by ASTM but it's great to hear like all these practical elements like the the temperatures the, the poisoning the catalysts uh, these are the kind of things that that did that you need to understand very well like moving forward like to ramp up the production of this fuel so to liquids which is not like specifically uh uh, uh a conversion process by itself, but it uses different conversion processes to produce SAF. But uh, we thought it was interesting to to give a dedicated slot here, given the the great expectations that we have in terms of power to liquids uh, moving forward, like to the decarbonization of aviation. If you remember the LTAG report, like this is the the biggest share of decarbonization is expected to come from this kind of technology. So I'm happy to have here our colleagues from the SAF Plus Consortium, Alexandru Jordan, who will talk about uh, power to liquids. So uh, Ryan, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, not Ryan, Alexandru, the, the floor is yours. Can you hear us? Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, Bruno. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, uh, thank you to my colleagues for, for the great presentations that set the table uh, in a very nice way, you know, in a way, because my presentation is going to be uh, kind of pulling a bit on, on a lot of that knowledge sharing uh, that was before. Uh, because as you said, Bruno, uh, power to liquids, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit of a uh, a different way of doing fuels and I'm going to explain how but mostly using most of the same building blocks like all of, as all of the other pathways presented before so uh, very very comp complementary so uh, hi everybody and I'm uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation so Alexandru Jordan I'm co-founder and uh, uh, Chief of uh, Technology here at SAF Plus. Um, uh, SAF Plus is a Canadian company. If you go to the next slide, just uh, just two slides to to because I think most of uh, most of people uh, know our, our uh, uh, the companies that that passed before us. So just spending two two seconds here. So SAF Plus uh, is a pioneering sustainable energy company. Uh, in the field of ESAF, uh, we've been uh, in this uh, in this field since 2018. Uh, certainly, um, North America's first uh, first company in this space, uh, and uh, we've been very uh, actively developing and helping to develop the field as as we go forward, working with many of the technology licensing companies, some of which uh, you know we've we've heard today and we've seen in the slides. Um, today, SAF Plus is developing, uh, we're developing our own projects internationally and developing also uh, uh, an integrated repl replicable plant design uh, that will be uh, deployed in our projects. And we have uh, global offtakes uh, for, for ESAF uh, already from, from uh, Air France KLM and uh, another one announced for uh, Air Transat, which is a Canadian company. Next slide. Um, and as 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 in international development, we're pursuing all the, the different regions where um, hydrogen, low uh, low carbon hydrogen, low carbon energy makes sense. Uh, we we understand that that's not going to be the case everywhere. So we're uh, as it was the case with the other pathways, feedstock or at least uh, uh, availability of energy and feedstocks is going to be a very key part in selecting pl uh, places to install these projects. Uh, we have currently several projects uh, in in Canada, the EU, and the United States, and looking in Central and uh, South America. 
So next next one, uh, let's let's dive in. So first things first, I'm uh, starting with a with a general uh, definition here. Power to liquid means the manufacturing of synthetic hydrocarbons from carbon dioxide, so CO two on one side, water, and in a process that is entirely uh, electrified. So uh, this the diagram you can see it here. Uh, we're really taking CO two. Uh, it goes in that what we call the PTL manufacturing plant. We are going to see it. It's a broader. It, it means several things. It does. It's not just one process. It's a it's a sequence of processes. But ultimately, we end up with hydrocarbons. Uh, most of it uh, could be uh, synthetic kerosene. Certainly, in the case of SAF Plus, we are pursuing uh, synthetic kerosene as the uh, main uh, product, and then <clears throat> that kerosene by uh, displacing fossil fuel uh, ends up having uh, more than 90 percent uh, carbon footprint, uh, footprint reduction compared to jet fuel so the end products we call them e-fuels e-kerosene or e-sap or ptl fuels you might hear or see both uh, used in the next slides next slide so um, I, I know there's going to be a series on the market demand. So I'll not, I'm not going to talk too much here, but I just wanted to, uh, uh, to to go back to what Bruno was saying. P PTL is emerging as as a, uh, a third leg, I would say, in the in the strategy for deploying uh, synthetic uh, kerosene uh, or sustainable aviation fuel. Um, you can see here that there are different scenarios being done by many different organizations mostly uh the progress of ptl in, in the market so as demand is going is going to be a uh, function also on how fast the levelized cost of electricity of green electricity is going to decline and how much of that clean electricity is going to be deployed that's that's basically the main the main factors for or limitations to deployment right now but the demand is uh, is is real, and uh, first deliveries are expected before uh, 2030, uh, driven by European regulation, but also by by uh, by some companies who are showing leadership in this case. I mentioned Air France KLM, Air Transat, United uh, also announced some PTL contracts. So we see more and more people in that field being interested. Next slide. On the um, on the feedstock side, I want to talk about CO2 uh, and first of all um, introduce a, a knowledge that you might have heard in the news uh, we're talking about point source capture or direct air capture basically this is two ways of getting the CO2 and fun fundamentally once you get the CO2 the processes afterwards are the same but the, the way you get the CO2 and where you get it is is really what what makes a difference between the two point source capture is uh, uh, the, the process of, of capturing uh, um, CO2 from industrial flue gas or effluents. So really getting from a stack, the CO2 comes into a process, uh, goes into a liquid, uh, most often might be even a, a solid, where the CO2 is captured there. The rest of the effluents, meaning uh, nitrogen and, and other, other gases like that, oxygen, uh, are, are going out to the atmosphere because they, they don't have any... Uh, let's say negative influence at that point. And the CO2 afterwards is released, uh, usually just by, by general heating is released again as pure CO2, and then is, is taken to the PTL plant. That's point source capture. Uh, we start with uh, CO2 concentrations from 4% in, in kind of the lowest effluence uh, you, we can get. And, and it can be up to 95% in, in, some, in some streams. We talked about, uh, uh things like uh, co2 from uh, fermentation or, or or from ethanol uh, plants or or from biogas plants so those could be very high quality and quantity uh, sources and uh, general technology maturity here at large scale is considered to be nine because many of these plants have been uh, deployed in in a lot of already industrial existing uh, processes uh, and also for the purpose of uh, carbon sequestration. So uh, usually considered nine, which is the highest you can get here. Uh, on the other hand, direct air capture is the process of, of capturing CO2 from the ambient air. Um, this is the, the, the real challenge there is 
uh, the fact that CO2 has a concentration of roughly 0.04%, so you have quite a bit of a difference between point source and, and direct air capture uh, just there. And, and, um, and that uh, um, technology maturity is, is, is increasing right now. We're hearing pro projects in the context of carbon capture and sequestration. And but by my account, by what I understand today, we're roughly in the TRL7 scale. So if we go to the next slide, uh, essentially between the two, uh, they produce the same amount of e-fuels and displace uh, roughly the same amount of fossil fuels. And because of that, they yield similar carbon in intensities on a life cycle ba basis and have similar benefits. Uh, the differences come in the cons consumption of electricity maybe, and, and maybe some other process specific parameters uh, because of that difference in carbon uh, concentration from the starting point. Um, and I want to just add uh, that, that on the point source uh, side, uh, some of the industrial effluents, while you know, are a bit more controversial to use, and uh, I can talk about that next. But generally speaking, the first generation of plants are, uh, of PTL plants, are expected to prefer the point source capture at this point. Uh, next slide. So I was talking about different point source capture um, uh, categories. So you know the the one that is pops in everybody's mind, I think, as as a go to uh, is is you know pairing it with uh, power plants, uh, uh, so power plants or uh, or or some of the refineries, which which are obviously very large uh, em emitters of CO two, and uh, they they are potentially good source. Um, I put it on the top there. Um, unfortunately, this is where there's some controversy and I don't want to get there uh, fully, but I think the ICAO reports also touch on that uh, when, when we were looking into point source. So uh, for those interested, there are going to be some sources interesting there. Uh, then there's what we call a hard to abate industrial sectors and applications. This is where the process or the equipment cannot uh, completely eliminate CO2. Uh, through process changes or electrification, and main examples of that are steam and cement manufacturing. Um, and then lastly, but not least, uh, biomass feedstock processing plants, uh, ethanol, biogas plants, uh, you know, pulp and paper, uh, biomass incinerators, all of those kind of plants, they generate the CO2, but that CO2 comes from biomass, so we call it biogenic and Usually, it's uh, you know jurisdictions like the EU are are gearing and and like focusing efforts towards using that kind of CO2 uh, to meet the 2050 uh, targets. Next, uh, next one. On the electricity side, we also have to uh, be uh, you know very very clear on what we are using. I think. Uh, um, the, the Chris from from Givo pointed out very correctly how important it is to use low carbon electricity. Um, in the case of PTL, it's the same because electricity is uh, the main source of uh, of, uh, of energy in the process, and the process does use use quite a bit of electricity. So I have just a, a simplified example here, just looking at the grid in Quebec versus the grid in overall Canada. You can see with the Quebec grid, we we get a very very good 90 percent uh, more than 90 percent reduction in 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 that carbon intensity of the fuel uh, whereas with uh, the generic canadian average grid we would be above the we would essentially the sap would essentially have a carbon intensity that it was that would be above uh, that of jet fuel so it is very important but there are regions and there are ways of making sure the electricity supply is uh, lo uh, very low carbon uh, and this is a, a big part of selecting uh, projects for us and selecting your locations and partners. Uh, next slide. Um, the other, another point I think that is interesting is to kind of understand, okay, what are we talking when we're saying it's going to be using a lot of electricity? Uh, what are we talking? And uh, I, I recently, most recently, colleagues from uh, the Ascent uh, uh, Research Center associated with the FAA, they, they started putting together some estimates of the power needed to produce ESAF. Uh, they, they, they went really, uh, really big saying, okay, if, if we want to power all of the flights a thousand kilometers uh, or more in 20 of the largest hubs, how much power? And that power requirement right now, it's about 100 
110 gigawatt of power generation and, and that's a big number um, compared to the US it's almost one tenth of the US power generation uh, entirely but when we look at the full uh, installed uh, PV capacity in the world it's about 15 percent of the capacity in 2019 so you could see as the world electrifies that that this uh, this uh, capacities can become realistic to deploy. I'm not saying that uh, that all of those flights will and should be electrified, but I think it just gives us an idea that this is uh, technically uh, really in the realistic realm. Next one. Uh, the, the next slides are going to dive in a bit more in the into the pathways uh, because uh, th there are several pathways of doing PTL or ESAF the way there are several pathways of doing um, you know BioSAF uh, as we've seen and most of these pathways they just leverage on on on, on blocks that have been developed uh, in the past uh, here um, I'm going to talk about three of them that uh, that seem to me and seem to us uh, in our analysis closer to 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 becoming uh, useful or reality in the future in the in the next decades uh, the first one being the fisher drop pathways uh, essentially has uh, you know the, the, the there's two main conversion steps there's the intermediate conversion step uh, where we aim to produce steam gas in this uh, pathway and then you you have that uh, the other step which is from the steam gas to get to the synthetic crew then from that to to jet fuel so ryan uh ryan touched a lot on the fisher trap so what whatever ryan explained on the fisher trap it works here in this context very well uh, the same maturities the same suppliers and and on the on that um, reverse water gas shift side uh, there which uh, which is the block um, uh to 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 make seen gas one of the blocks to make make seen gas there's a lot of work as well and the topso colleague uh, explained uh, about topso and there are other companies working in that field so so really the the main point in this pathway where the innovation concentrates is in the intermediate scale is how we do how do we do seen gas in the most effective and efficient way um and there are two ways so the reverse water gas shift pathway and there's another one which is a uh, direct co-electrolysis so basically water and co2 they are both uh, injected at the, at the same time in an electrolysis uh, device and then we get uh, syn gas uh, through that uh, reaction now if we get to do the syn gas in a, in an efficient way uh, when it that goes through the fisher trap conversion we end up with a, pro a product that would be compliant with ASTM uh, D7566 annex 1 so that is a very interesting, uh, uh, I think, uh, advantage of this pathway. Next one. The next ones are the uh, A to J uh, A, uh, path pathways. Uh, again, here the final conversion is going to be very similar to what uh, what uh, what uh, G, uh, Chris from Givo explained on the A to J uh, portion of it. What what is the emergent or where the innovation is is how we get ethanol through a through a ptl process and you can see also there are several different ways uh involving electrolysis and some several uh conversion steps there again if we manage to get the ethanol in this case uh in, in through that first uh, intermediate step when it goes through the atg conversion then we would end up having a, a product that is compliant with uh, astm and uh, next one Lastly, but not least, it's an emerging uh, route which uh, builds on the similarities with uh, the ATJ route. Uh, so it's called methanol to jet. So instead of starting with ethanol in this case, we we'll start with methanol to uh, to get to the jet molecules. Uh, now this this uh, pathway also builds on uh, past experience on methanol to gasoline. Obviously, it's not the same product, so not, not exactly the same processes, but there is some, uh, uh, there's a lot of expertise there in methanol to gasoline processes. So in this uh, step, essentially, we need to do the same electrolysis, go to the methanol synthesis, uh, this, this time instead of ethanol, and then from there, the methanol going to, the, to an MTJ pro a process that would look uh, like the process for alcohol to J that was mentioned, gen generically speaking. However, because the methanol is not 
yet qualified uh, under ASTM D D4 D54. This would not yield right now. Today, this would not be the compliant uh, an ASTM compliant product. So the pathway is under needs to undergo actually an evaluation. I I, I think the, that evaluation has started already and. Um, once that is in place and when that is in place, then the, the product would be uh, able to be used in aircraft to a certain amount of, uh, to a certain percentage. Now, before I go further, I just want to mention that all of these different pathways, they, they, they essentially use the same three building blocks, CO2, electricity, uh, and then uh, water. So, uh, the, the main difference is how do we get to that hydrocarbons and the differences are going to be in how much electricity in the end is used in the process uh, you know what is the more more optimal way of of, of doing this process uh, in from an electricity perspective and how much yield of SAF can we get on the other side uh, and I think this is what's interesting having these three variants is is really a, a tremendous uh, a way to diversify basically because we can build on all of the all of the different know-how from the fissure trough from the methanol to to jet or from the alcohol to jet pathways to really truly find the the, the you know some of the most efficient pathways for ptl and if we go next i want to spend the, the last uh, the last two seconds on on explaining uh, just just giving i have the pleasure or the challenge of, of trying to uh, to give an estimate on the maturities here um, of, of these different blocks uh, and then to kind of give you a sense of where where they are um, i'm not going to dive in all of them but I, when i'm uh, i was mentioning uh, final conversions are going to be similar uh, for ptl as the uh, as for bio biomass pathways so whatever progress is made there, it's going to be helping uh, PTL as well. So the maturity is going to go up with the first uh, GIVO commercial plants, with the first, uh, well, with the Sassol uh, commercial plants or uh, other plants like that are going to be, are going to be uh, bringing that technology uh, readiness level up. On the uh, intermediate side, uh, we're, we're going to have to, look keep a good uh, you know a, a, a good eye on what's going on there uh, SAF plus has been spending the last five years deep diving uh, and 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 understanding and working on together with technology licensors and, and and partners on understanding which one is the pathway that uh that is most uh you know ready for a first of a kind market deployment here uh, and generally speaking, we believe that Fisher Trap, reverse flow gas Fisher Trap is the, the more mature pathway and also uh, has the advantage of being STM compliant right away. And because of that, if we go to the next slide, uh, this, is, this is the pathway we've selected for our, our, our first projects. And, and the, as you can see here, uh, we're developing a project in Montreal, uh, which will be our first uh, first project and and probably one of the first of a kinds uh, in terms of uh, of PTL uh, plants in in the world. Uh, it does uh, leverage the reverse water gas ship fissure drop uh, and will be targeting uh, sustainable aviation fuel as the main pro product. If we go to the next slide, you can also see a three D three D mock up here. That shows the the hydrogen production um, uh, infrastructure, the CO two capture, uh, and then the ESAF production. This is uh, how 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 this kind of plants uh, uh, will be looking uh, in the future. This is uh, so a 90 million liters per year of ESAF and around 20 million liters per year of of e -NAFTA. Um, and will require some 40,000 tons per year of H2 uh, to be produced on site. So this is this is where the water and the electricity meet and and are converted into hydrogen. Uh, and the the, the the carbon capture is around 267,000 per year, and an investment around uh, 1.5 billion dollars uh, of, of of investment. Now for the fuel characteristics, as I said, would be ASTM. Uh, qual uh, compl compliant. Uh, the first ESAP deliveries, we believe they could be as early as 2027. 
uh, this is what we're 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 targeting, and then the carbon intensity uh, of the of the SAF would be about ninety percent lower than jet fuel, um, and uh, the production costs. Uh, I, I I did not put them out there, but our as was the case for explained also by Chris uh, from GY. I really like the presentation, by the way, Chris, as you can tell. Um, the the production cost will be uh, actually uh, very very much in 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 the range of in the lower range of uh, you know what we can imagine in this second generation of fuels. Uh, but on top of uh, on top of uh, of it, obviously, we need to account for some of that capex uh, uh, cap capex uh, investment uh, return on investment, as as Chris was mentioning. So this is something we're working very hard, and we have a lot of, of traction uh, in our strategy. So thank you so much. I hope this was uh, give you, gives you a, a good, uh, I would say, 101 in, in PTL. Uh, the, the main takeaways, uh, there are several technical pathways that are possible. Just some of them are uh, compliant. Uh, the technology maturity varies. Uh, but some of them are already at, at the you know, first ready for deployment. Uh, the commercial uh, size of the operating plants is 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 uh, there's no sorry there's no plant at uh, operating at commercial site, but there are several projects underway, uh, and ultimately uh, the choice of CO2 and electricity sources have a big impact both on opex uh, and on carbon intensity and social acceptability. So these are really the four takeaways for my presentation today. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. That that was also great, like uh, to to highlight this aspect of the electricity, right? Like so, in the end, that's what PTO and EFUs are about. Like is to use electricity like very intensively on the on uh, and with the existing pathways. And it's uh, great to see like that you need uh, high, to highlight that we need like a lot of renewable electricity to ramp up these. Uh, uh, this technology and just to highlight one more aspect here like uh, all the other technologies that we heard uh, today like they we already have like all, all the framework under Corsia is already done right we already have the default values like the life cycle methodologies are pretty much ready to go and we're already seeing these fuels being certified for Corsia and we are on our way to have the same thing for power to liquids fuels like because we have these aspects of the uh, the carbon intensity of the grid, as Alexander was mentioning, right, as we were mentioning, that uh, that we need to be addressed, like, from a methodological point of view, and we are moving in that direction in IKEA. We hope to have, like, uh, news on that very soon as well. So thank you very much again.